Okay. <clears throat> um, before I start, essentially, you, <clears throat> you should be starting in on lab three, which was basically lec last week's lecture content. And, uh, well, that's it. There's no assignments in this class. It's, it makes my announcements really, really short. Um, so that you guys know, I'll give that announcement now because there's always the big panic of when's the midterm, when's the midterm, when's the midterm. The midterm is the week before reading week. That means you have no work for me at all over reading week. Goose egg of work, which makes people happy. Because I know what other profs do during reading week. You go, oh, you got a whole week off. Here, have a 22-hour assignment. You think I'm kidding. <laughs> I do it to my database students. So, uh, you know, it is what it is. Um, today we're going to be talking about file permissions. Um, it's, it's a good time. No, but we're going to go with it anyways, because um, file permissions are challenging under the best circumstances. And we're going to cover a few um, odds and ends, and I'm going to skip the, um, the in-class exercises because there's groups so small that it's not even worth doing it. Um, but maybe I'll decide to, we'll see how my time is. All right, now... Inside of Linux, what determines what a person can see and or do is all based on file permissions. Um, and the permissions depend on who the user is, what group the user belongs to, also depending on what you're trying to do and where you're trying to do it. And in the end, there's a mask of permissions that applies to every single file and directory in Linux. Um, some of you may have experienced this in Windows where you go and move, try to move some files and notice says you need to be an administrator to do this. Or any of you ever share a PC with someone else and then you try to go into their user directory and you can't because you're not them. So unless you're the machine administrator, then you just take over all their files and now they can't see their own files. Um, Windows has similar sets of permissions. Uh, as in, they've got your permissions and group permissions. In Linux, there's one level past that. So, however, before I start talking about the different levels of the permissions, there is one user where permissions do not apply. It's the root user, user called root, also known as the super user account. Um, there are a few Unix systems out there, not Linux, but Unix systems where the user is not called root, it's called uh, SA. Uh, but those are rare and far between because everybody just sticks to root because it's the convention. Um, Essentially, Linux ignores permissions for the root user. Regardless of the person's permissions, they can go in and look at any file, touch any file, change permissions on any file. Uh, the only way to protect yourself from a root user from seeing the contents of your file is to encrypt your home folder. Um, then they can't decrypt it, theoretically. So remember, root can see everything you do. So. For example, when you do an ls-l, you guys have done that already looking at the contents of a file, of a folder, and you'll notice the very first thing is you have is a weird block of letters. And this is an example that comes up with drwxrwxr blank x, then a bunch of other information. The very first um, set of letters is the permission block. The very first character, this one, which I did with the mouse, that one, with my cool purple laser pointer, is indicates what kind of file it is. D means directory. Uh, there's other characters in there, um, but essentially if there's nothing there, it's a file, otherwise it's a directory. If I switch to my Linux terminal, you can see that there's a bunch of directories and a few that don't have the D. Those are files. When, if I go back up one, 
The other one you'll see here is an L link because it's a file, it's a symbolic link. It points from, it's a file that points to a different place. It's a shortcut, more or less, on the file system. So, the other things you'll see in there is the rights. These are rights that are also known as your permissions. These are things you're allowed to do. Uh, a bit like, you know, you have certain rights as a human being. Well, on the file system, the files have rights. And it works with bytes. So, there are 10 bytes total. The first byte is the file type. The remaining nine bytes are the permissions themselves. There's links, the number of links, and then who owns it. And it's usually based on the user ID. So, again, 10 bytes go to here, number of links, uh, user group, and then file size is next. Date modified in the actual file name and or directory name. Now, that first character, if it's a dash, it means it's a plain file. If it's a B, it's a block device. This is something people are used to using Windows never see in Windows because these don't exist in Windows. Um, block devices are very special files. And essentially, the Linux, files, the Linux operating system uses a file to talk to your hardware. So there once was a time if you wanted to send something to a printer, you could cat the contents of a file and redirect into you know, a block device. So you could send it to serial port one and stuff would come out of the printer. It's kind of nifty. Um, or if you wanted to transmit files down a modem, you could send signal down the serial port and send data down the serial port that way. It was interesting. Not very useful because it wasn't modulated, but you know, you could. Um, there is a character device type, D is for directory, L is a symbolic link, and P is a named pipe. A named pipe is literally a file that pipes data into a program. So you've got an application running. We're not even going to get into pipes in this, <laughs> in this course. But essentially, it's theoretically possible to create a file on the file system that every time you uh, append to the file, as in you redirect output to that file, that output actually gets sent to a memory block that the, an, an application can actually view. So imagine if in Windows you had a directory, and every time you dropped the file in a directory, it would load in Photoshop. Instead of dropping it into Photoshop, you actually dropped it into that directory, and Photoshop would open it automatically. It's kind of cool. But instead of being a directory, it's a file. So you take a file, drop it on another file, poof, Photoshop. Um, I'm simplifying, but that's essentially what it is. All right, so after you've spent off your first bit, you mean your first, yeah, your first bit identifying the type of file, there are now a set of three octets. That's so another three bytes of information, each for the permissions for the user, the group, and other. And other is basically the world. We used to refer it as world, but they've changed it to other. And essentially, the user owner has certain permissions, the group has certain permissions. And the first nine is usually what's used. There is actually more than that. Um, Nine covers it. There's uh, 12 bits total. The 12, the the other bits do weird stuff. The permissions and rights allow for control access to files and directory or its content, whether or not they're allowed to be run. Every single time you try to touch the file, the system double checks to see if you're allowed to do it. So, it's pretty great that way, actually, because it makes sure. Uh, there once was a time where Windows didn't check permissions at all. You went in, you did whatever you wanted to do, and hey, you're logged in, you're allowed to modify anybody's files anywhere. Permissions didn't exist. The m more recent versions of Windows are significantly more you know, retentive about permissions. They've had to get that way. So this is a screenshot. My name is not Hubert, but you know. And this has a complete set of permissions and What's on here is the very first byte to illustrate is the file type. The next one is the user owner permissions. This is the group permissions. That's the other permissions. And the next one is number of links to that file. 
the owner and the group. So whenever you're looking at a file and you want to know all the important permissions and stuff, those are the sets you need to look at. Often if you try to read a file or write a file and you can't, that's probably because you don't have permissions to do it and you have to check the permissions. Or you're just logging as root, then you don't have that problem. So there's three access permissions that exist. And read, write, and execute are the three. Read means you can actually look at the contents of the file. You can open it up with a text editor, you can cat it, you can run less on it. If it's a directory, that means you can run ls. So if you have read permissions on a folder, you can go ls and actually see what's in it. If you don't have read permissions, theoretically, you might have permission to go in there, but then you're blind. You can't see anything that's in there. ls will return an error or return nothing, depending on how the system's configured. Write is obvious. <laughs> it means you're actually allowed to change the file content. Therefore, you were able to read the file, you made some changes, then you can write the file, also known as saving. And with a directory, that means you can add and remove files and directories. So when you're dealing with permissions in a directory, the write permission means you're allowed to create a new file. You're also allowed to delete a file. You can create a new directory, a subdirectory, or you can remove the subdirectory. Execute. If it's a file, that means you can run it like a program. Yay. Um, way back in the day, when we used to actually have to download applications manually for Linux, and the files would come down and none of them would have the execute bytes turned on, unless it was a specific kind of archive that they supplied for you. So that then usually in the readme file that told you how to install this you know, application or program or whatever, it'd say, okay, now these three files need to have ex execute permissions. You've got to change these files to have you know, this ownership. You, you know, there was this whole process. Uh, execute on a directory, on the obviously you can't execute a directory. Execute on the directory means you're allowed to actually go into the directory. If you don't have execute set on a directory, that means that other people can't get into that directory, except for root. Root ignores permissions. All three permissions can be a, applied to all three groups of, of users. The very first kind of user is the user itself. So whoever owns the file or whoever created the file, their active permissions. The group is if you belong to certain groups. So uh, look at the file and if I go back to this and this is actually a really bad example because everything's owned by root, but this is owner and group. And if you are part of the group that's on that file, then those permissions apply to you. If you're not part of that group, the permissions don't apply to you. And then others, that's anybody else who's in the system that does it's a, that is either not you or a group that you belong to. So, everybody else. <sighs> now, did you guys learn how to do octal math and computer essentials? Yeah, we're back to that. Except the good news is you never only, you only deal with one set of values. One byte, zero to seven. So octal math is, you know, zero to seven. And that's one byte. Wow, magic. Um, and essentially, the way the permissions work is there's a series of octal values that determine what you're allowed to do. Um, when you look at the file system, it gives you a stupid letter. That those actually the three letters, read, write, the RWX, basically amounts to one set of permissions. So, if you have no permissions, base value is zero, and then going up is one, two, three, four through seven. Seven means you're allowed to do absolutely everything. Read, write, and execute. So a common way of fixing problems, and this is not the right way of fixing problems on Linux, is to change permissions to 777 for everyone. And anybody can run and execute. It's a stupid idea. Uh, that means that even unprivileged users can go in modify stuff. Usually the only folders that should be like that is the temp folders. 
So instead of using numbers, we can also do it in symbolic, which is a lot easier for humans to understand. Read, write, and execute. RWX. So when we look at something like this, make sure I'm pointing the laser the right way, RWX, R blank blank, and R blank X, whatever, those means that those are read, write, execute blocks. And they map out a certain way. So if the permission is 100, zero, that means it's read. In other words, the very when you look at the octal number, you've got three sets of numbers. And 100 zero is read, one, uh, zero, 010 zero is write, and zero, zero, 001 is execute. And that ends up being 111. Which is full permissions. And essentially it does a little bit of math also. 2 to the power of 2 is 4. Which, you know, if you're doing counting in, um, you know, 1, 2, 3, here comes 4, 5, 6, 7, right? Because you're 3 bits. It's amazing how high you can count on one hand. Um, but the essentials are your bits and that'll do the math. So theoretically you could actually use your fingers to figure out your permissions, right? And uh, don't flick out too many, don't flick too many people. Because, you know, this is read permission. That's going to go on YouTube with me flicking the bird at my students. So, actually, I already hit the class exercises. The... So this is symbolic mode. This is equivalent to what? Yep. All three. So that means you have, it's basically uh, 777. Read, write, execute. Or 666, depending if it's a file directory. Because a file would be 666, directory 777. Uh, the user itself has what permissions? Which, which set of, obviously if everything is read, write, execute, that means the user has read, write, execute. Um, if you have read, write, execute, read, blank, X, read, blank, blank, is equivalent to what octal mode? Don't forget, it's basically three sets of numbers, right? So each bl each letter, it's three things. So the group permission has this combination, one on each side. So if we go back to our little chart, one on each side is five. Right here. So the group has permissions to read and execute, but they can't write. And the last one, the last symbol, so the, it would be uh, seven, five, and four. So just so you know, so this chunk right here, seven, five, four, if you're actually dealing with numbers. And it's the easiest way is just going back to that little chart that has the numbers. That way it's easiest to figure out the math. And the last one is 755. Read, read and execute. No, that's not right. Yeah, that's right. 755. Everybody else has the permission of 5, which is read and execute. So that's essentially how that breaks down. Now changing file permissions. The command, now that we all wonderfully understand all those stupid numbers and letters I was talking about, which we all, none of us do, just saying, you know, you're not going to understand it until you do the lab, then you play with it. 
Um, changing permissions. File permissions can be modified with chmod, also known as change mode, which is interesting. It hasn't, the, the command doesn't refer to permissions ever. It's changing the mode of the file. And it's used in two ways, which is the most common way that most people separate Octal way is the really old way. When I was learning Unix, not Linux, the Unix, we could only do it in Octal. We didn't have the symbolic mode. Man, it would have made life so much easier. So symbolic mode allows you to set permissions using the letters, so you have to remember the octal. So command is chmod, then you say who. So that's the first block right after here. And you can actually use a combination of those letters if you want. If you can, there's a user group other or A for all. So you could actually use UGO. UGO is the equivalent of A. So you could go chmod A. It's the same as using UGO. Where you could actually theoretically give permissions to group and others at the same time. So you could go chmod, chmod go, GO, will allow you to determine who you're giving permissions to. So what you're doing is you're flicking. U, G, O. It's your, basically you're referring to each set of octets of permissions. Then you have three operators you can choose to use. You can only use one of these at a time. You can go plus as in you're going to set the permission. You can use equal which means you're going to set the permission explicitly and remove all other permissions. Um, because there's something called the sticky bit which allows certain permissions to stick. Using the equal operator, you can force it to not to ignore the sticky bit. So, for example, there's uh, something called the sticky bit you can set on the directory, and any files that get created in that directory will have certain permissions stuck to them at all times. So you can always make certain files re re executable. Whether or not the other people want to be executable, they'll always be executable. The equal sign skips the, ex the sticky bit. And then you got negative, where you can remove a permission. So you could go chmod uh, go minus r, which would mean group and others can no longer read these files. The command will look, I'll, there'll be an example in a second. Um, you can also use the absolute mode instead of using the octets. And you have to give three sets of numbers every single time. And you got to give the user rule, the user number, the group, and the others. So chmod, instead of saying a plus r, you actually have to give the numbers for each of the permissions every time. So it's actually, if you want to modify permissions for just one set of the users that can access the file, it's actually easier to use symbolic than to use, otherwise you have to actually know the, uh, the octet for the permissions. Um, chmod, the octet, fine. And any digits that are emitted, so if you just go chmod 6, will be replaced by leading zeros. So that means it'll be 006, not 600. So if you go chmod 7, Basically, just James bonded your file. If you want to remember, 007, right? Um, if you did chmod 6, my file, you Frank bonded the file, his ugly brother. On and on and on. But normally, you don't want to just give one number. Why? because you're assuming the other permissions automatically and it's not a good thing. Because since it goes user group others, you're taking away your own permissions and letting anybody else at the file. It's the most permissive set of permissions you can give it because anybody can touch the file. Okay, chmod's got one really handy argument. Dash capital R. 
recursively. Now, anybody want to say what recursively means? Going once, going twice, fine, I'll do it. From here down. Basically, any anything in this directory plus any child directories and all their files. It applies to permissions to everything in the current directory going downwards. So the children inherit all the parents' sins. Uh, permissions, I mean, not their sins. So here are a few examples. chmod 77 file one will give full permissions to everyone, the owner, the groups, and anybody else to the file. You're allowed to do whatever you want to that file. You can even run it as a program. chmod A plus RWX, same deal. Everybody can do everything to the file. chmod you go plus RWX file one, everybody gets all the permissions. And as you can see, the last two do all the same thing too. So just to give full permission to someone, you've got the choice of uh, five different ways of doing it. Can't say they didn't give you a glut of options, which makes it harder to learn because there's so many ways of doing it. Now, oh God, I hate this part. Okay. Any good operating system applies default permissions. That's just the way it is. If you didn't have default permissions, then there would never be permissions on a file, and who could access the file? No one, except for root, which might be the safest answer, but, you know, nobody could access the file. So when you log in, it sets default permissions for everything that user is allowed to do. And the initial mode that everybody has after you log in is 666 or 777. For files, you automatically get 666 permissions. In other words, every time you create a file, it's read-writable by everyone. Every time you create a directory, it's read-writable and executable by everyone. In other words, people can go in. So that's the basic rule. However, there's something called UMask. And a lot of people say that UMask is not subtracted. See, there's like a little note at the bottom of the slide. UMask is not subtracted. It is a mask. Yeah, it looks like subtraction. <laughs> and that's basically how you calculate it. And again, so full permissions on a directory, 777. We'll have a UMask of 000, zero. by default, right? As default, UMask of 000. zero, zero means that the default permissions stick, 777. So the permissions stay there, as is. Now, UMask, if you want full permissions of directories, 777, because that's the default mode, it applies a UMask to it. The U default permissions become 755. So when we say UMask is not subtraction. It's not 777 minus 22. Which is what it looked at, you know, when people say, well, when you subtract 22 from 777, but it still looks like it's 755. But what it's actually doing It's you're doing the you're doing the subtraction on only one column at a time. So you're not subtracting just one number from there. Is each piece of the UMask is applied to just their set of the permission. So owner, group, everybody else. If this is the default permission, this is the UMask. This becomes which as far as I'm concerned is subtraction. But you're not doing traditional subtraction where, you know, if the default permission is 770 and you're doing 022, you can't subtract 2 from 0, so you have to, you know, start. That's not what it does. Essentially, what it does is it'll take this number, subtract this number, and if this number is bigger than that number, it just goes to 0. So if I did 77, seven, you know, like that, then the permissions would be this. 
And for a file, since file full permissions on files is seven uh, six six six, the match of zero twenty two, it'll be six four four. Now I'm going to post um, a link at the end of the lecture. Hopefully I remember to do it. And did I lose my page? I have a chart, which you can't see, but I'll post it at the end of the lecture. That essentially shows what this basic file permissions are and what the UMask is and what the ending permissions would be. So if ever you give it a UMask, it gives you the matching number. So it's actually really handy because it basically has every combination of every UMask with their effective permissions in there. It's a quick lookup chart. And actually, I just did part of this. Is if you had 777, the UMask is 777, then the permissions are zero. No permissions allowed. So what happens is it starts out with full permissions. It applies your personal UMask to it. And then that's the effect of permissions. Now, root by default has a UMask of 000, just so you know. Now, to modify your UMask setting, you can display your settings by typing in UMask. Actually, I'm wrong. Root doesn't use... It'll use 0022. Ignore the first zero. So the default UMask for everyone on Linux is 22. Well, 022. And then you can change it by setting a set of rules, which is UMask 044. That means instead of being 2, 2, it'll be 4, 4. It'll take 4 away from the 7, making, you know, the effective permission 3. It's just how it is. Um, or you could use symbolic notation if you wanted to. Uh, UMask U plus W. That means that the user is allowed to write all the time to the file. A equals RW. That means everybody can read write to the file. And user group read write others write. That's the basic UMask. So if I did you can see that my UMask just changed to zero zero two. So essentially it's saying that starting at seven Take away zero. It's still your permission will still be seven, because read write. Take seven, take away zero, it'll still say at zero, because we gave it read write permissions. Others have read. Therefore, if seven and or six is read write, take away two, it'll put it only in um, read only mode, but no write. This syntax is easier to understand than the, the numeric one. Okay. Now, to create a default file mode of read, write, read, read, what combination of UMask would you want? Anybody want to take a guess? Um, no. Uh, well, the first one would be zero. It's a given because you don't want to modify the default permission. So then you got to look at the next two. And yes. So essentially, when you take one, the first one off of it, it's going to remove the execute byte. So RW minus one removes execute. Then you do read only and read only. So that means you need to subtract three from it. 
because one is execute, two is uh, write, so one plus two is three, which leaves you read, which is four or five, depending if it's a directory. If we want to do read, write, read, write all the way across the board, what permission set do we need? What do you mask? Uh, ignore the first zero, just the three, one, one, one. And if we want a default file mode of no permissions at all, seven, seven, seven. Now, if we had a new file, which starts out with 666, right, which is read, write, read, write, read, write, with a U mask of 2.2, two, two, what permissions would we have the effective permissions be? I'll take the numeric one if you want. We're working with files, so that's our set. So what would we have after we apply our mask? Six four four, which would be uh, R W, uh, yeah, R W X R W R W, yeah. Problem is, I half the time I have to go up, double check these numbers in my head because, you know, yeah, R W X. Actually, no, wrong. R W X R X R X. So that's a file permission. That means that the owner can mod the owner of the file can read the file, mod change or delete the file, and execute the file. Everybody else can read and execute. And the funny thing is, is you can have the execute permission on a file, but if you don't have a read, you can't run the program. So if you want to run the pro, well, let's say you wrote a program, you want to let somebody else use it. Everybody else has to have read and execute permissions on it. Otherwise, you can't run it. So if we had a new file with a U mask of 011, what do you think the permissions would be on that? So if we did 011, That's our effective permissions. So now we know that six read, write, and execute. And we know four is read, execute. So what's five? Yes. So that means that you'd be allowed to read the file, write to the file, but you can't execute the file. So if we keep working our way down, There we go. There's our happy little chart. I'm actually going to post charts to this after I'm done the class, before the lab, because I have these on my phone, not on my laptop. So I'll, I just got to copy the URLs across. And a directory that's uh, 777 with a default UMask of 11 would mean, would give you an effective permission of 766, which means you could read, write, execute. And on the directory, it would be um, 6.6 six on the directory, which means we wouldn't have, have execute permission on the directory, which means you can't go into the directory. You can read right out of the directory, but you're not allowed to go into the directory. Uh, here's a, f a couple more examples. UMask 022. So I'm actually going to go through it and actually do the exercise real quick. <coughs> 
All right, so 022, give me read, write, read, and read. And if I change the file, Now I've set it to be read write because that's six, no execute. And then you'd have read only, which is five, and write only, which is two. And I've got these backwards. Of course I do, because I try to remember them off the top of my head. There we go. I'm a dumbass. Um, oh, that's a long one. Chmod u plus x. Group minus x. Others. Plus read file 2. Now I've made the file read write accessible by the user. Because as you can see previously, right up here, and my mouse doesn't work on there. So after I did this permission set, I had read, write, read, execute, and write. So now what I did is I wanted to add execute for the user, which I did. I wanted to take execute away from the group because I wanted the group to just be read. And others were allowed to um, read the file. So read, write, execute, read, and read write because when we first set it up the, f uh, the world was allowed to write to the file now you have and I got a typo There we go. All right, so I'm going to say, I'm going to change the permissions to be explicit. So the user in the group have read permissions. Others are losing their ability to write. So in the end, I should just end up with write, 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 I mean, read, read, read across the board. So these are the ways you can flick the switches back and forth using you know numbers, absolutes, and symbolic methods. All right. Now to deal with the rest of it, and this is the easy side, compared to the numbers, because the numbers suck. And like I said, I'm going to post a couple of different utilities you can use to figure out your UMASKs and your permissions. Uh, I actually got a UMASK calculator that says, you know, assuming you're using 6.6, your default permissions are 6.6.6, and you want to give these default permissions, it actually gives you the UMASK, so you can figure that one out. Um, and then once you play with it a little bit, it'll make more sense to figure out your bits and pieces. Now. If, on the other hand, you want to change the owner of the file. So one of the quirks with Linux is, let's say you're logged in as root, and you create a new directory. And for those of you that have run any kind of server on Linux, whether you're dealing with a web server or a Minecraft server or whatever the hell else you're running, but you're running some kind of server, and you're, running, you're doing all the work as root, the problem is that the, everything you create owns, belongs to root. And with a web server, that can get a little iffy because if it's owned by root and the permissions aren't right, the web server itself can't read and write the files inside its web root. Um, what I'm saying now sounds like total gobbledygook, but when you go take your web development class, it'll all come home to roost. Um, so what you end up doing is you want to change the owner of the file. So you want to play with the ownership of the file. And the command to change the ownership of the file is chone. CH own, in other words, change owner. And it's fairly straightforward. You chone, give it who the owner is, and then the file name. As again, we also have the dash capital R, which means recursive. Change the permissions from here going down. You can also make it change the group, and you can use it by prefixing that with a period. So if you want to just change the owner of the file, you go chone space username 
space file. If you want to change the group that owns the file, you can go chone dot group name file. If you want to change both the owner and the group, there's two different syntaxes. You can either go chone owner dot group file name, or you can do the old syntax, <coughs> which is the one <coughs> I learned back in the day, which is chone owner colon group file name. Now, okay, so I got a file directory here with a bunch of number, a numeric user, like you, looks like your student number, but not quite. Let's say I want to take one of these directories and make it belong to root instead. I could go. Actually, hang on. Oh, here's my file one, which are with the default permissions. Oops. Okay, so I was making sure my UMask was set to default before I messed around anymore. Okay, so I got a file called file one. I could go chone. Because as you can see right now, before I go any further, even though I'm not in my home directory, I'm in the user's directory, I created a file called file one. It's owned by root and also belongs to the root group, the group called root. Let's say I want to change the owner of the file to be that. So if I were, now you can see that this file is now owned by that user, but it still belongs to the group root. That means that the first octet of permissions, that very first RWX, would allow that user to do whatever they want to that file. If I want to change that to, um, change that back, but I want to make it belong to that group instead. Now I change just the group by using the period here. So it's owned by root, but the, that group has permissions to mess with that file. So that group would be allowed to read. That means that even though it's in my home folder, I would never be allowed to actually modify the file or delete the file, but I could see what's in it because I belong to that group, A6607. But root still can modify the file. Or I can also go, and now it's owned by the group and the user that based on that, that number. Um, now some of you might be wondering why the group matches the username. Every time you create a user in Linux, it creates a matching group so that that user has his own group that belongs just to him. So if you want to let somebody else touch your files, you could actually add them to your personal group. Not that I'd recommend it, but it's an option. All right, there's another command called chgrp, which is change group. So you can change the group owner of the file, dash r. Um, now, if you are a regular user, in other words, you're logged in as your A12345 user, you can either change the ownership of the file or change the group of the file if you're a current member of that group. Um, however, if you want to change the file's owner, you have to use chone as root. So if you want to change the owner of the file away from yourself, you have to actually go in as root to change the permission on the file. You can change the group. In other words, you can say anybody who is in the games group can see this file, but you still own that file. Now, if you want to stop owning that file, you have to go in as root and change the permissions on it so that it's owned by root. All right, so we're almost done. There's some minimum permissions when you start dealing with
um, moving files and deleting files and stuff. And the permissions are as follows. If you want to delete a file, for a directory, you must have write or and execute. So if you want to try to delete a directory, um, so to delete a file slash directory, you have to have write and execute on the directory to be able to delete it. If you want to do just for the file, you don't need any special permissions if you own the file. To copy a file, a user needs the following things. You have to have execute permission in the source directory. For the target directory, you have to have write and execute. And for the file itself, you have to be able to read. So for the parent directory, you don't need to be able to read write. But you have to be able to go into it. So uh, I wish I brought my bo a box. It's the easiest example. So for example, I got stuff in my box, right? And I want to copy a file out of this box. To be able to copy a file out of this box, I need the following things. I need to be able to go into the box. Execute. I have to be able to read the file itself. I don't need to be able to read the contents of the directory. Do you notice right now I can't, still can't see? So it means I can't see what's actually in the directory, but I know the file's called clip, for example. So I'm going to reach in here. I'm, I'm, I'm allowed to read clip. In other words, I'm allowed to see what's inside a clip. I might not be able to, allowed to see if I can see clip, but if I know clip is there, I'm allowed to see it. So then I can read clip. So now, right now, I have permission to go into the, read the con and look at clip. I can't tell if clip is actually in there because I'm not allowed to see inside the box. But then I can, if I want to put it somewhere else, I have to be able to write to that and execute. I don't need to be able to see it, but I have to be able to write and execute. In other words, execute the directory. You're allowed to go into the other directory and you're allowed to do something. And you're allowed to create something in that directory. It's kind of cool because in Linux you can create files without being able to see them. You can read files without being able to see them. But if you want to see them, you have to be able to read. And to move a file, you have the minimum permissions are, you need write and execute, both for the directory and uh, for both the source and the target directory, so they have the same permissions. The file doesn't need any special basic permissions. So as long as you can write and execute, you can move a file. All right, that's the end of that. This is like the worst info dump lecture ever. Actually, no, it's not. The database course is. Um, so essentially, the stuff you need for lab four, uh, I will be posting my, my, my couple of URLs to Brightspace so that you have a couple basic tools to help you with the UMasks and stuff. Uh, but essentially, it's remembering user, group, and world, and whether or not they're allowed to read, write, and execute, and remembering the, the magic number that matches the, the, the applicable permission set that goes, you know, up the side. And that's it. Okie dokie. So...